Good day from ebusradio.com. I'm Nick von Stein. Today with me, I've got Jason O'Reilly from Advance Intellect. How are you today? Oh, very well, Nick, and uh, thanks again. Good to good to speak to you. It's great to have you here with us today. We're going to be talking about the current skills shortage in the data world, specifically in the South African context, and the consequences of said issues. Agreed. I, I, th- I think it's something that I read about every day. Um, and it's something that we see people highlighting, um, you know, specifically when it comes to, you know, analytics and it comes to cybersecurity. Um, I think uh, I read an article by one of the vendors we support pretty recently. And, uh, you know, the conversation was very simply around, you know, when we look at the threats that our customers and um, our children are under, uh, specifically from a, a targeted, uh, you know, hacking perspective and uh, and an information threat perspective, you know, how do you how do you solve a software problem with people? Um, and and very simply, the vendor's approach to to that conversation is you, you're never going to solve a software issue which is vulnerabilities and gaps in applications which are taken advantage of by utilizing people. So you've got to utilize software to fight software, which again, makes sense, right? And there's also an education aspect to it. You know, a lot of a lot of the, the data breaches that come about are because of human error. Um, if you can eliminate or restrict that, er- that section in human error, which comes about with data learning, um, you can hopefully f- help fight it. Agreed. Agreed. I think it's 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 always that uh, you know we talk about user behavior analytics in in our space. You know, if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It must be a duck, right? Uh, and if we look at algorithms and we look at code and effectively how our organizations are being infiltrated, um, utilizing different techniques, um, and that's everything from social engineering. Uh, you, effectively, you know, you start to understand that you know if it looks bad, it must be bad. So there is definitely a level of education at, at a human level, but I think when we start talking about errors, um, which effectively are not malicious uh, intent by people, um, you know, a great example is, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you're typing up an email, um, you attach a document, it happens to be some confidential information, and you send it off to Jason. And funny enough, Office 365, being what it is, has got four Jasons, and you happen to click the first one. Um, <laughs> and by that time, your confidential nice, information, yeah. even though you've got your disclaimer on your email, is already gone, right? Um, the nice thing, you know, which I think many people are not yet grasping, um, is that that can be eradicated and that can be dealt with in a very efficient way. It's just about understanding what's in the market. Um, and how the likes of artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, user behavior analytics are all adding to ensuring that organizations and their data are being kept safe. Now, there is a benign side of all of this, which can, of course, become a negative. And I'll give you an example at the moment. You know, we're all under lockdown. There obviously is an increased amount of data being used by governments. Um, And there is a potential for abuse of, of said data. And that's just one of the current fears that we have at the moment, just to give a current COVID example. Yes. It's possible to to help alleviate that, or is it just a case of states have so much power naturally that they can do these type of large data operations that kind of bypass a lot of the security measures that can be put in place? Look, there's there's always a conversation to be had that you know when a customer, sorry, when a government entity wants to enforce certain things, they can, right? And and whether that's uh, spying on its, uh, its citizens or whether it's uh, leaking data or, or whether it's taking advantage of data. You know, there's always some regulation or legislation that potentially could, could be or couldn't be passed. I think one of the key critical things for us is when we look at the data conversation and how people are trying to protect the information today, unfortunately, it utilizes mechanisms that are, you know, five to six years old. So things like fingerprinting uh, documents and, you know, um, hashtagging documents and, and making sure that documents have got a specific tag on them to prevent them from leaving an organization. Unfortunately, taking the COVID example is documents are created off the network today. 
So, you know, you've got to you've got to relook at your strategy around how you're protecting the information. The great thing is that there is solutions to these problems. I think the challenge that we have with many, many, many customers and global organizations and governments alike is that when it comes to prevention, you know, we still stick to doing things we've always done because those are the things we're comfortable with. I, I'm really hoping, I think, through this period of COVID and the advent, obviously, of everybody working from home, people are starting to realize that if they don't do things differently, they're not going to be around tomorrow, right? Um, and I think that's been a concept that's sort of been going on in the market. Uh, you know, we talk about, and I think we've mentioned them before, we talk about Uber. Um, they don't own a single car, but they are the largest fleet in the world that you know, transport people, right? Um, you know, those kind of disruptions um, cause significant issues. And, you know, same thing in our analytics world and our cyber world is that if people are not look, looking at the data effectively and if they're not looking at how they can prevent either information loss or uh, information exploitation in a different way, utilizing mechanisms that are at their fingertips, they're going to struggle. You know, like I said, you, you cannot fight a software issue. You can, believe it or not, even from a user behavior analytics perspective, you can fight the human issue, right? Because, you know, this comes down to policy. You know, if a policy is created at the right level of a government or an organization, you can put the right techniques and mechanisms and software in place to prevent information or a potential uh, breach of information. So these things exist today. Um, the challenge is, is getting people to look at it, change their mindset, and know that doing things that they did, you know, three years ago is not going to pre prevent the adversary today who's going to gather that information because you're not utilizing um, whether you do behavior analytics or whether it be machine learning or whether it be artificial intelligence. You have to. Um, you know, I think data is moving at, at the speed of light today. And if you're not looking at your strategy as to how you're protecting your organization, how you're utilizing your data at the speed of light, um, you're going to fall behind. So, just to give you some examples, is um, as, oh, it's not you. You know the examples. Just to give the listeners some examples. I know that just it must have been about three years ago, the UK NHS got hacked. And the yes. reason they got hacked was because they were running Windows XP in 2017. Um, yeah. One example. Um, just also to highlight that it's not always just an, an African or South African perspective. These happen all over the world, no matter what country you're in. There's a lot more fraud that happens um, in our small business and our medium business uh, organizations today. And and again, coming back to your, your similar example of not having the correct operating system in your environment, um, that could potentially expose you, just as the NHS was exposed. And unfortunately, in many of the organizations that we engage with today, you know, their primary business is not IT, right? Their primary business is whether it's manufacturing, whether it's uh, development, whether it's, uh, you know, hand-to-hand -hand door sales, doesn't matter. That's that's their business. So the IT conversation generally doesn't doesn't get the airtime that it does until Something it happens goes to wrong. be an incident, right? Until something goes wrong. Correct. Correct. And then, it, and then the question is, is but why didn't IT protect me? And, uh, and, and again, I think the, the one thing that we know in the IT market is that there, there are a, a lot of service providers and there are a lot of people that, that bolt on security to their services. Uh, you know, they switch on an antivirus or they sell you a what we term as a unified threat management platform. And with the hope that those technologies are going to help you. Um, and the reality is, is yes, that is the baseline. But when we start looking at specifically how fraud is occurring today inside of organizations and how they're being breached, unfortunately, that isn't good enough. And this obviously brings it all right back to the, to the topic I started at the beginning, which is there's a lack of of data knowledge just in within the general public and especially you could say within corporates of Africa. Correct. Correct. And look, I, I always, I uh, believe it or not, I am, um, I subscribe to a number of services, you know, locally and globally. And I think the one thing, the one thing that we've seen, you know, internationally is that there are sanctioned entities that make, um, digitization and online experience, a government issue, right? There are um, 
you know, there are entities that this is their sole mandate is to educate the population about what it is to be safe online. Uh, the UK has got a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, website, which which effectively helps organization or helps people, people in general, everything from your kids surfing online to organizations uh, understanding what they need to do in the event of an incident. You know, who do you call the national helpline? And, and I think, you know, when you look at globally, who's taking responsibility uh, you find in government is taking responsibility. And I think we, you know, even though 4IR is waking that up and, you know, President Silmaram Paz is bringing that to the front, I think at the same time, there needs to be a, a national cyber security forum, which I know there is one that does exist, but it's almost one that not everybody knows about. It actually needs to become mainstream so that, you know, everybody who has a cyber incident has the ability to pick up the phone, not to the bank, but provide that to the government. Why? Because the government's responsible for um, allowing certain uh, cables to come into our territory. And I think it's always something that we've said is, you know, if you stop it at the gateway of the problem, you know, we always talk about, unfortunately, you know, I think uh, you think about the gateway to, to anything is if you have the ability to stop it at the gateway, you protect everything that is downstream. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have a long way to go as and as a continent to get there. Um, but I think there's some great examples internationally where um, the governments are stepping in so that they can help small businesses. I mean, if you look at the targets today in any threat report that you're reading, it is small business that is the target because they don't have the resources or the expertise to protect their information. And, you know, there's there's a lot of really wealthy small companies out there. And, uh, you know, one incident of fraud can, can cripple them for forever, right? That's something also to consider is that not every company wants to become a big giant corporation. So a lot of them, especially like in the German circumstances, their family run businesses, the yes. community run businesses, and that's the size they're always going to be. And they're the ones that get targeted. Look, and this is the one thing that I want to say to the listeners today. And, and you know, you stop thinking of, of your IT guy as the go-to guy. The reality is your go-to is the internet. Uh, and when I say the reason the go-to is the internet is that you can consume a service that is better than what any service provider can give you today um, from the internet, providing you with the, probably you know twice as much security um, but giving you the assurance that you're protected. I think this is the thing that we're going to start seeing now with COVID coming out, right, is the consumerization of services in the IT industry. So you'll find that there are managed service providers that have popped up all over the place. And what you do is you, you switch on and you switch off and consume those services as and when you need them. So you change the level of conversation around, oh, I need to have this specific thing in order to make sure that that specific thing works. But actually you don't. You can consume a service, you can have a better experience, and you can be far more uh, secure than you were before. And at the same time, I know data analytics is going through that phase as well. How do you consume data analytics as a service? It doesn't. It's not only suited for the large enterprise entity. It's also suited for, for small business. And I think this is what a lot of people don't realize. You know, the internet is the gateway to so much opportunity. It's just about figuring out how do you unleash it, right? And how do you guys unleash it? Unleash it. Through data. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, look, listen, Google's your friend, right? Um, doesn't matter what anybody says, you know, whether you're using Google, Bing, whatever your search engine of choice is, um, you know, the simple task is, you know, uh, security as a service, type it in. Um, you know, when you look at security as a service, um, you will find that there are a number of service providers. Uh, there's your uh, Microsofts, your IBMs, your Oracles, you know, everybody is popping up with a, a service that you can consume. And if you're not happy with it, you can switch it off. And, and I think this is where we're seeing the market going. And Google's your friend. You know, um, there are industry experts um, out there, and and a lot of them are great to listen to. And hopefully, you, you know, your your uh, your listeners are enjoying the podcast that we're doing. But again, we're a gateway to information. Um, you know, the information is readily available for you. It is about you know understanding that you can consume these services. You do not have to be a PhD in cybersecurity to get cybersecurity. 
um, you know, it takes uh, it takes 20 minutes on on Google. Um, do a little bit of searching security as a service. Um, you've got service providers there that you can enable quite simply. I mean, Microsoft have changed the game. Everybody's utilizing Office 365. You're already utilizing a service. Microsoft are introducing security left, right, and center. Switch on those services because it's part and parcel of some of your service. So again, it's just it's taking the time, like with anything, um, and it's doing a little bit of research, utilizing what you've got at your fingertips. Um, and if you're not sure, again, you know, reach out, uh, reach out to myself, reach out to your industry experts, and say, listen, I'd like to figure out how I change my cost model and how I become more secure in, in, in you know, utilizing this digital, uh, you know, evolution that we're going through. Yeah, Microsoft was a great Microsoft. example to bring up. Um, everyone thinks of them as just the software company but they've had to become so much more than that because of how technology driven the world's become in the last two decades. Microsoft realized um, with Satya realized that they can provide a platform for customers to utilize. Look at how they've changed their business model from going a licensed sales company. They're not, they're not a licensed sales business. They are a platform utilization business. What is important to Microsoft is how much of their platform you are utilizing to enhance your digital experience, whether whether you're using it for CRM or whether you're using it for security. They've looked at this and said, we need to make it easy for our consumers to be able to do this effectively and securely. And, and rightly so. Unfortunately, I, I do have to highlight that Microsoft, as much as they would like to be everything to everyone, they also acknowledge <laughs> that they're not. Yeah. So, so, so again, um, you know, I think you, you have some of your really critical niche providers that are doing it far better because they're still agile, right? They're not the Titanic. It doesn't take them 20 years to bring a product to market. Um, they're doing it a lot more effectively. And that's where we're seeing, obviously, digitization changing and these businesses popping up left, right, and center. So... It's just it's just about understanding, you know, where do you go and what you do, and and this comes back to like we were saying in the beginning, when you look at the skills shortage, that is effectively I think there was a number of four million that was bantered around last month in an article, a four million gap in skills for cybersecurity globally. You know I appreciate that, and 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 I think you need to understand that, but I think if we also understand that the advent of the internet, the platform as a service. The, the managed service, what you can do is understand the foundations and then switch on a really great skill, um, which, again, you pay for as a service. So why do you as an organization need to consume or you know man an entire entity? Don't get me wrong. I think it's important that organizations do have people because the verification of what other people are doing is becoming more important now. You know, It's all fine and well, and we always talk about this. We say, who's checking the checker? So it's all great that you've got a guy doing IT for you and you trust him. And that's great. And, you know, he's probably doing a great job for you. But but how do you know that he's doing the job correctly? Lastly, Jason, can yes. we get some contact details for you guys at Advanced Intellect? Absolutely. Um, you can reach us on our on our website. Again, we, we like to use that platform. So www.advance-intellect.co.za. Um, I can be reached uh, on uh, jason.oreilly at advanced.co.za or even happy to leave my number, which is 0722-815570. Um, happy to answer questions and, and happy to help people uh, navigate uh, the challenge of, of digitizing their businesses and, uh, and their lives. Happy. Jason O'Reilly, thank you so much for your time today. Nicholas, thank you very much.